Um, so our last panel of the day <clears throat> is going to consider geopolitical issues that impact the right to food. And our first speaker is Nadia Lambeck. She's a public interest lawyer who served as an advisor to the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Olivier Deschutes, assisting on all aspects of the mandate. In 2014, she worked with the Global Network for the Right to Food and the Civil Society Mechanism to the Committee on World Food Security in conducting a critical retrospective on right to food implementation. For this project, she authored Civil Society's contribution to the 41st session of the CFS entitled 10 Years of the Right to Adequate Food Guidelines, Progress, Obstacles, and the Way Ahead. She has numerous publications on food systems, including Rethinking Food Systems, Structural Challenges, New Strategies, and the Law, and was Editor-in-Chief of the Yale Human Rights and Development Law Journal, which issued a volume dedicated to food issues in 2010. She currently practices in the areas of workers' rights, human rights and equality law in Toronto, Canada, and continues to do research consulting and educational work on right to food and food systems issues. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here and to be part of what has been a really excellent conversation so far about moving towards more just, equitable, and sustainable food systems. Today I'm going to pick up in some ways from where Smita's inspiring keynote yesterday left off and talk about national implementation of the right to food. Examining implementation provides important lessons on how to continue to understand, evolve, and grow the right to food as a normative, legal, and collective action framework. To frame my uh, remarks before I begin, I think it's helpful to remember that although the right to food is not a new right, indeed it was first included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the 1940s, and later in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights in the 1960s, it's really only in the last two decades that we've seen a significant increase in the visibility of the right to food and in the theoretical and normative development of the right. Today, though, there is a greater understanding of the concrete implications of the right to for food for a range of state, international, and private actors and the importance of adopting a holistic approach to food insecurity. Yet despite these advancements, and as I will explain in more detail, little progress has actually been made at a policy, legal, and institutional level in effectively creating an environment in which the right to food can be fully realized. Indeed, states and international institutions have been slow and more often unwilling to make concrete changes, and a whole host of challenges have made progress in implementing the right painfully slow. Today I'm going to spend some time discussing how the right to food has been implemented at a national level and touch on some of the limits to this implementation in part by referencing some of the exciting alternatives that have also been developed in the last two decades. I'll end with some reflections on the right to food, specifically as a tool for collective action and positive change. So the first step um, is how have states actually adopted the right to food today? Before getting into the meat of that, I thought it would be helpful to return briefly to the state obligations that the right to food imposes as this is a helpful way to understand uh, implementation. You'll recall from earlier discussions that the right to food is not the right to be fed, but rather the right to be able to feed oneself, family and community, adequate, nutritious, and culturally appropriate food in a manner that preserves and even celebrates human dignity. Following this, the right to food imposes basically four obligations on states. Uh, the sources for these obligations are the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, which have been authoritatively defined in General Comment Number 12, um, and then expanded upon in the Voluntary Guidelines, which outline how the right to food can be implemented nationally. 
And I think it's important to note that these voluntary guidelines were negotiated and drafted by all FAO member states, including the US, as well as civil society groups, and were adopted unanimously, unanimously uh, just over a decade ago. So here are the state obligations. Uh, so the first one is the obligation to fulfill the right to food. This means that states must ensure that all people have access to adequate food, and where they do not have access, the state must facilitate access or provide access. Facilitate means that the state must proactively engage in activities intended to strengthen people's access to and utilization of resources and means to ensure their livelihood, including food security. Provide means that whenever an individual or group is unable for reasons beyond their control to enjoy the right to adequate food by the means at their disposal, states have an obligation to fulfill or provide that right directly. Where you see quotes um, up on this graph, I'm quoting from general comment 12. The, object, uh, um, the obligation to protect requires that states must ensure that third parties do not engage in activities and interfere with the ability of people to meet their food needs and the obligation to respect requires that states not engage in activities that interfere with the ability of people to meet their food needs. The right to food also requires a number of process requirements, um, and this essentially is what is the, the human rights approach. And the FAO has come up with a nice way to help us remember them, which is the word panther. Um, so participation, accountability, non-discrimination, transparency, and then ensuring human dignity, empowerment, and rule of law in the development of any policies, frameworks, legislation, anything to do uh, with the right to food. So how have states implemented their obligations? The quick answer is that to date, we don't really have any examples of states taking a broad, holistic approach, integrating health, trade, agriculture, et cetera, and all four of their obligations into coherent, legal and policy framework aimed at achieving accessible, available, and adequate food for all. What we do have, however, is important first steps. So one way in which countries have started the process of adopting the right to food is through constitutional protection. Constitutional rights serve as governing principles for states, and they should not be derogated from. Uh, to date, over 20 countries, including South Africa, which was the first country to adopt the right to food, um, and the, number, the countries, the darker shaded countries here, have adopted the right to food in their constitutions. I think it's interesting to note that this is, only 20 countries is far, far less um, than Anastasia commented this morning have adopted the right to clean and a healthy environment, which I think she said was about 80 or 90. The next way countries have adopted the right to food is through legislative protection, what we call framework laws in right to food lingo. Um, these framework laws provide legal protection for the right to food in a coordinated and detailed fashion, linking and building coherence between diverse areas that impact the food systems, trade, agriculture, health, fisheries, education, finance, et cetera. And Latin America is really in the lead on this front. Um, another way is national policies. Policies allow for long and short-term strategic planning, coordination of funds, benchmarking, and monitoring. Brazil is usually cited as the leading case study for national strategies aimed at ending hunger. Using largely a participatory model, Brazil has instituted over 50 initiatives uh, implemented by 11 different ministries to address food insecurity through the country. These range from cash transfer programs, school feeding programs, income generating activities, and so on. There's also sectoral laws, and I haven't elaborated that because most countries have some agri-policy law or, or something. Um, another way that courts, or that countries have adopted the right to food is through judicial recognition. Courts can serve as key monitoring accountability agents of domestic laws and constitutional pr provisions, providing a venue for the review of government action or inaction by individuals or groups within the state, and a place for further defining uh, state obligations. The ongoing case of the People's Union for Civil, Civil Liberties and the Union of India and others, 
which was initiated in 2001 in response to the government's failure to distribute employment and food relief is perhaps the best known example and really the most expansive example of judicial interpretation of the right to food. Over the last decade, the case is, I believe, still ongoing. Uh, the court has issued uh, a series of significant interim orders that have recognized a constitutional right to food in India, determined a basic nutritional floor, and provided directives for a number of, of programs and policies, such as a, a school feeding program, food distribution and work programs, and a guaranteed employment scheme. So the last way in which countries to date have started to adopt the right to food is through food security and nutrition coordination institutions. Uh, and these institutions attempt to coordinate efforts across different ministries and sectors um, and where possible include participation of civil society in the elaboration and implementation of food and agricultural policies. Again, the, most, the best known here is Brazil um, and, and probably Mozambique. I think it's fair to say that in most cases, while there have been some advancements, as we can see here, um, there are still massive problems at achieving change on the ground in all of these countries listed here. There are, of course, a variety of reasons for this. We've heard many of them so far in the past couple of days. Lack of political will, unforgiving global systems, a lack of policy coherence at the national and international level, corporate capture of resources, markets, and governance arenas at all levels, and we could go on. However, another major challenge has been how states have chosen to think about the right to food and their obligations. The majority of national policies and legal frameworks that have been adopted and that are, are listed here tend to focus on the state obligation to fulfill through a combination of programs aimed at both providing food directly and to a lesser extent, assisting with the means of acquiring food through, for example, extension services or guaranteed work schemes. In many ways, I think this draws from the past practice of treating food uh, as in a charity-based model. What's harder to locate at the national level is rice-based strategies and policies that focus on the obligation to respect and protect the right to food i.e. policies or practices that regulate state actions or the actions of third parties to ensure that they don't interfere with the ability of people uh, to meet their own food needs. And this is a really key point because by failing to address their respect and protect obligations, states are failing to adopt what could really be truly transformative aspects of the right to food. States are simply providing a sort of band-aid solution rather than addressing the real causes of hunger and malnutrition and poverty more broadly. Furthermore, states are undercutting possible progress in reducing hunger by continuing to engage in activities and allowing third parties to engage in activities that reduce the ability of people to meet their food needs. In this way, states are reinforcing the same patterns and power structures that have led to dispossession, displacement, structural violence, and poverty in the past. Um, to put some context on this, um, I'm gonna turn to the, the country of Malaysia. Um, they provide a great, a great case study. Malaysia has been on this self-directed road to becoming a high-income country by 2020 and has been progressively establishing poly policy frameworks to achieve this goal, including the introduction of a number of programs to increase access to food they're subsidizing food in remote areas, establishing cash transfer systems for poor families, and they've even recently established a minimum wage. However, at the same time, Malaysia has been systematically dispossessing indigenous people from their land. They failed to enforce labor standards on farms where the most food insecure populations are employed as agricultural workers, and they are actively converting and promoting the conversion of agricultural land for palm oil production, a largely export-oriented crop. These practices hinder the ability of people to meet their food needs. I've put up on the slide a picture of representatives from a number of communities in Sabah, Malaysia, that are fighting a proposed hydro dam development, which will lead to flooding of their lands and hence their dispossession from not only their homes, and historical roots, but also their means of subsistence and livelihood. The communities have largely been left out of any decision-making about the dam, with no right to participate, 
uh, in the decision-making process, and neither the state nor the development corporation um, has engaged in any human rights impact assessment uh, to evaluate the impact of the dam. The process is implemented, and the displacement that will result violate the right to food of these communities. Often in response to the challenges and the limited progress achieved in advancing the right to food through implementation and the lack of government regulation of its own actions and the actions of third parties, the last two decades have seen a rise in the development and implementation of other alternative models of transforming the food system, such as local food policy councils and food sovereignty policies, both of which are deeply rooted in, the demo in democratic principles. Food sovereignty policies and legislation have been developed in a number of local, national, and regional contexts under the impetus of agrarian movements. And I think my co-panelist, Marcella, is going to highlight uh, some of these legislative frameworks in Nicaragua. Um, and food policy councils have transformed the ways in which civil society can participate in the governance of local systems. I'm not gonna get into much more detail about these as we've already discussed some of these models over the last few days. But I think it's worth noting that these models, and in particular food sovereignty, have really grown from the ground up and have been led by people's movements in opposition to the right to food, which has largely to date failed to capture the public imagination and has been promoted by only a few. Another interesting development that I think is worth taking note of is um, attempts uh, often by peasants' movements to articulate new human rights that have been going on in the past couple years, um, like the Declaration of the Rights of the Peasants at the Human Rights Council, which includes the rights to land, productive resources, as well as the right to set agricultural prices. These alternatives, defended by local and transnational peasant organizations and food movements more generally, have succeeded not only in creating new narratives about the structural change needed in our food systems, but also in establishing new institutions and governing practices, and perhaps new human rights. These new models are not incompatible with the right to food. In fact, all of these models are mutually reinforcing. But because the right to food has failed to really capture public imagination, which is necessary for progressive change, these new models are exciting because in many respects they breathe new life into the right to food these models help us understand the perceived limits of the right to food, both with respect to how the right has been implemented or not implemented to date, and within the framework itself. And I'm not gonna go into it, but here are some of the challenges, both practical and within the framework itself, um, with the right to food approach. But these new models also reflect those elements of the right to food approach that resonate more widely among rights holders. They expand our understanding of the right towards a more inclusive participation of citizens and increasing democratic control in the governance of food and agriculture and towards a transition to more localized food systems. Mita did a better job than I can do in saying why the right to food is such a critical framework for collective action and progressive change, so I won't repeat her here, but I thought I would end my presentation with a quote from Laljil Desai a pastoralist who works with the World Alliance of Mobile and Indigenous Peoples, because I think he captures not only what is happening globally, but what I hope is happening and I think is happening in this room with respect to the right to food today. He says, the right to adequate food and nutrition serves to connect seemingly disparate struggles and peoples in different parts of the world, turning what might otherwise be local issues into an interconnected global fight for human rights. By uniting fisher folks in Uganda with pastoralists in India and raising our voices for one another, we can put pressure on governments and other actors to respect, protect, and fulfill uh, our human rights. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to Priscilla Clays who helped me write the paper that formed the basis of this presentation. Thank you, Nadia. Our next speaker is Marcella Pino. Marcella is co-founder of Food for Farmers, a nonprofit organization 
dedicated to bring lasting food security to coffee growing communities. She has been working with coffee organizations for more than 10 years, exploring best methodologies to develop effective strategies to improve the well being of smallholder coffee farmers. Her goal is to create bridges between resource rich industry and vulnerable coffee producing families through participatory methodologies, identifying the causes of food insecurity, developing content context-based solutions and providing necessary tools for program implementation. In 2009, <clears throat> she joined the Rural Livelihoods and Agroecology Group at the University of Vermont in its master's program in natural resources. Her current research centers on the effects of livelihood diversification and agrobiodiversity of coffee producers on food security. Marcel is originally from Costa Rica and has lived in Vermont since 1991. Hello. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm very glad to be here. It's been uh, a great two days. And um, let's see. I'm gonna talk really fast because there's a lot to cover, so I apologize. So, um, my presentation is around a, a case study of a food security program that we have with a coffee cooperative in Nicaragua. Um, but first, I would like to say, there you go. Um, so, uh, our mission is to work with um, coffee communities developing sustainable food security programs. And we look at food security not as a goal, but more as a symptom of poverty and inequality. Um, we help organizations to, uh, uh, identify the challenges, the resources, and the solutions to uh, hunger in a sustainable way, whatever that means. Um, in terms of coffee, if you're not very familiar with coffee, um, just briefly, coffee, the most of the coffee that we drink comes from smallholder farmers around the world. And smallholder farmers, uh, cof coffee growers, face the same challenges that other smallholder farmers around the, glo the globe face. Um, in one hand, they have an increasing demand. A lot of the times these countries have institutions that give some support in the form of either credit or technical assistance. Um, that's kind of the best scenario. Sometimes they don't have, most of them don't have any. Um, and on the other, um, there is the risk factors. Um, at this point, climate change, I don't know if people have heard about the coffee rust epidemic that um, decimated coffee plantations in Mesoamerica, and this is still, there are a lot of people that are still haven't been able to recover from that. The fluctuations, fluctuations in the coffee price that can be very unpredictable. Um, the fact that these growers are, have a seasonal economy, they get money either once or twice a year, and they have to stretch that income throughout the whole year for their whole family. And their volumes are small. They have small farms. And um, the yield, even with great prices, even if they sell at fair trade prices or organic premiums, is not enough. Um, these are marginalized populations in rural areas. People don't get the services that sometimes people get in urban areas. And in developing countries, this is, um, well, there's all kinds of challenges around this. And, of course, we all know the high price of food that has been uh, rising uh, for the last decade and a half, at least. So, Nicaragua is a small country in Central America. It has around 6 million people. And, since, uh, and until uh, 1979, it had a series of dictatorships and that ended with the uh, success of the Sandinista Revolution. Yet after that, they spent at least 10 years trying to protect that revolution against the contrast. Um, so historically, Nicaragua is said to be the second poorest country in the continent, um, one of the poorest countries in the world, second after Haiti. The, 
the um, rates of poverty, malnutrition, and foreign debt are really high. In the 1990s, early 1990s, foreign debt was 100, uh, 400%. Yet, in the last 10 years, Nicaragua has seen an improvement in the indicators in poverty and malnutrition in food security. This table, for example, shows the changes in the rates of uh, poverty and extreme poverty, which are very significant, um, especially around extreme poverty, but even you know, for poverty, it's, it's very, very significant. Also, in food security, um, this is an example of the uh, prevalence of undernourishment in the population in the early 1990s. It was 60, is I was 54%, uh, and in 2014, um, it was below 17%. So some people said, you know, wh what happened here? Um, it's probably that, you know, there was peace. It was finally some peace, so the government was able to pass some legislation that um, helped. Uh, the, uh, Remittances from immigrants are very significant, around 10%. Um, and also, just um, the foreign aid. There is a lot of uh, what we call cooper uh, cooperation or cooperation from Europe and all kind of all the world, and has been incredibly intense in Nicaragua. So um, there is an evaluation of, um, oh no, that I was going to tell you about the law, because otherwise Nadia is going to be mad at me. Um, in 2007, uh, Nicaragua passed a, a human development plan. It was a strategic plan, and it was specifically focused to improve poverty and extreme uh, poverty. And one of the actions plans was a law that was passed in 2009 called, called the Food uh, Security and Food Sovereignty Law, um, number 693. Um, and this law was not only uh, trying to uh, in, uh, help the poor and the extreme poor to overcome these challenges, but also protecting women and um, the rural areas, uh, increasing uh, investment in the rural areas. And, um, and it works uh, more as a guideline for all this cooperation that I told you about. Um, it's not so much that Nicaragua has the means to um, do a lot of governance around this law, but it does work as a guideline for organizations like ours that work with their communities. So there was an evaluation about um, this, uh, this law, and it turns out that, yes, there is not much implementation, and also, there's not much monitoring. So what happened? How come these indica indicators um, um, improved? So the evaluation from Caritas um, list um, these, these factors. In one hand, the legislation uh, that ad addressed the uh, problems of poverty and the extreme poor. Um, that the fact that the government finally is incrementing their fiscal revenue, and so it is investing in public services. The revalorization of family farming and small-scale uh, rural econ uh, enterprises. And um, the fact that a, lo a lot more people can now study at all levels, including um, college levels and technical. And, uh, and the general improvement of health services. So um, although they have improved um, a lot, they still have a lot of work to do, um, especially around land issues. 35% of the people who own land don't have titles to their land. A lot of them are women, of course. Um, and also, um, in rural areas, 75% of the smallholder farmers own 5% of the land. So the land is still very concentrated. Uh, the problems of climate change and natural disasters that I'm not going to repeat myself because Rafael did a great job um, describing some of them. Human rights, the laws are targeting women, but they're targeting women more, more as a gate to families uh, and not as a right to women to, be, um, to have well-being. And of course, the global food systems that... Um, honestly wrecks everything, <laughs> um, as I'm going to describe later. So we work with um, a coffee cooperative called Sopexca in Hinotega, Nicaragua, it's the northern um, mountains of Nicaragua. And we work with Sopexca because they've been um, 
they've been uh, committed to diversifying uh, their, their crop from coffee because of all the problems that I told you before, uh, yes, and um, also because they've been very committed to the well-being of their membership. They have around 600 members, um, groups in 15 to 12 cooperatives. So we did a, what is called the Participatory Community Diagnostic for Food Security in 2011. And some of the findings are that, yes, the population does, does not understand about the law, the food security and food uh, sovereignty law, um, that their um, in food insecurity is mostly chronic seasonal hunger, which means that that causes stunting that Raj talked about. Um, and the seasonal hunger lasts around three months, three to four months year after year, and this is in be between the harvest. Also, they have a low consumption of fruit, vegetables, and animal protein throughout the whole year. So not only chronic seasonal hunger, but also unbalanced diets. They have a low utilization of farm products um, or farm um, um, land, but there is an awareness that they do need to diversify um, from coffee in order to um, achieve food security. Um, so the program that we started in, um, this is the second year, we started in the third year, it's around um, several strategies. The first one is food security education. Um, uh, I cannot emphasize enough how important this is when you have a population that need to change their behavior about, around diet and around, about um, agricultural practices. Production of families consumptions, which I'm going to talk later. The production to access the market through cacao and nanaro, which is a spice, and soil and water conservation, which are chronic problems and challenges. So how does the production for family consumption work? So the idea, the concept is to increase the production of beans and maize, and also to, whoa, five minutes, sorry. Um, and also to um, have a distribution center. And the way it works is that, um, the members of Hinotega, of, the, of this co-op, are spread throughout the whole department of Hinotega that has very different geographies and, and growing conditions. So the concept is that the people who live in lowlands that are able to produce the food, uh, beans and maize in this case, would, would have access to a credit that they can then repay. They can grow their food, keep the food that they need to eat, repay the debt either with, with food, beans or maize, or with um, money. Then this, the cooperative will take that fund and make it a revolving fund, okay? And then the storage facility would either buy those beans and maize or buy from the market when the price of beans are low and then keep that food for when the, f the price of the um, food goes up, which is during this type of um, food insecurity, this time of food insecurity. And then during this time, the co-op would resell this um, food to the families that are not able to produce as much food. So first, um, with the results of bean production, um, in the first year, we had enough credit to uh, plant 61 acres, hectares um, that cover 72 families. Um, during this time, uh, there was the production of beans was not that significant, but it was it was around 10,000 kilograms, I think. Um, year two, we increased that to 136 hectares, um, covering 137 families, which uh, produced around 700 um, quintales. So it would be around 70,000 kilograms. So the problems that we had, challenges that we had, the bean program is going really well, the maize not so well. Um, but I'm gonna show you, this is very important. This is probably the most important part. Um, in October 2014, the price of bean was 64 cents a pound. In January, it went up to, 50, to 90 uh, cents a pound for a saving of 40% for those people that were able to grow their own beans or um, or for example, the uh, food distribution center that were able to buy beans at that time. For the maize, 
There is something going on uh, that we really haven't figured out what it is, but the market has been flooded with cheap maize. Um, so cheap that people are very reluctant to take a credit to um, grow their own maize. So they are growing small amounts of maize and uh, the, high, the cost production is just even with the market, so it really doesn't make sense. So the co-op is not letting go of this, though. They have seen this before. It's just, you know, it's, it's what's going on right now, but they've been there for a long time and they're going nowhere, so they are gonna keep at it uh, because they understand that this is a very important, um, a very important um, strategy. So this is an interview with Rito Guadalupe Pical. This is actually not his uh, wife, but it's, um, we did this through interviews. And he was talking about the advantages of the program. In one hand, the credit is low. He can repay with cash or crop. Um, the, he produced 1,500 pounds of uh, beans, and he kept 1,200 pounds of beans sold the rest 3,000 for um, $156, which doesn't seem much here, but it's significant, I tell you, in rural Nicaragua. And then, most of all, he saved $326 that, um, that he didn't, didn't need to buy the beans when he needed. The disadvantages of the program is that sometimes we get hit with cheap food, um, and it doesn't really work that well. The distribution center is in the second year now. Uh, the capacity is for 126 tons of, uh, of um, maize and beans in 51 silos. The year one it was just construction and the setup of the internal structure within the co-op to understand how they were gonna um, um, operate. And the second year was um, uh, they were able to buy 80,000 kilograms of beans and they are holding these beans until they, we're just starting the lean season or the season of uh, food scarcity. Um, and we are waiting to see um, how that's going to go. So in terms of uh, conclusions and next steps, the first, you know, the next step is to, to see how the rest of the program goes. What are the, you know, the final results? How much do pe did people save? Who are the ones who bought the food? So far, we're seeing very positive responses. Um, it is, is a small way of disrupting the, the food system as, you know, as, um, as brought to these communities. Yet, we also see as a lesson learned that it is kind of impossible to get away from um, the speculation and the, the market price. It's a program that is still relying on the market price to some degree. Uh, but next steps would be to establish a, uh, a bank of seeds of native varieties. Um, this is a very um, important strategy for this cooperative and is actually a strategy that has been developed in Nicaragua throughout the country with many cooperatives of um, different types. This is not a new project, uh, I mean a new initiative in Nicaragua, it has done before. Um, so we are very encouraged, and um, I do think this is a great uh, example of empowerment, especially uh, working with women and families. Thank you very much. Marcella. Our final speaker is Ani Bellows. Ani is a professor and graduate program director of food studies in the Department of Public Health, Food Studies, and Nutrition at Syracuse University, <coughs> where she began in 2013 after chairing the Department of Gender and Nutrition Faculty of Agriculture at the University of Hohenheim is that right? in Germany <coughs> since 2007. Her work focuses on food and nutrition systems and economies generally, and specifically on curricular development, research, and collaborative advocacy to support the growing field of human rights and the right to adequate food and nutrition. She's a co-editor and co-author of the 2015 forthcoming Civil Society Academic Collaborative Book Project in t published by Rutledge 
entitled Gender Nutrition and the Right to Adequate Food Towards an Inclusive Framework. It is, it's really great to be here, to see all of you, to have three students from Syracuse University, and raise your hand, um, having uh, come along. Being the last speaker, um, there has been so much that uh, everyone before me has said that's been so valuable for setting the stage and it's helped me think about my work, realize how much I have to learn, and I'm very grateful for the conference organizers and for the speakers who've come before me. I want you to know, um, first of all, that this work is, uh, that I'm presenting is sort of a shameless promotion of this book, but it also, the, the theory that we came up with, um, it's very much a collaborative project, and when I submitted the abstract, um, everybody's name is on it, and we're all co-authors so, of this project. And I am the person who lives closest to Burlington, and so I'm presenting. Um, but uh, the, um, the project is very much a collaboration between, uh, it's an academic CSO, civil society collaboration, started out between uh, the group I worked with, um, the Gender and Nutrition Department at uh, Hohenheim University, and FIAN International, um, uh, a right to food human rights organization. The international headquarters was fortunate for me, based very nearby. And so I had an opportunity to, to learn from people who were doing it. GIFA, is the Geneva Infant Feeding Association, and they are the Swiss arm and the policy arm of the International um, uh, Baby Food Action Network. Uh, so together, we, uh, we were able to meet and talk in, like, from 2010 through 11, 12, sort of think through the arguments that I'm going to provide a sketch for today. Um, the question that we ask that basically frames um, our work is when so many call for the inclusion of women and a gender perspective in food security, why is the status of women and girls not improving? Um, it's not obviously all women who are, are food insecure. Um, but if you look at that typology of food insecurity and hunger, many people have, have already said the most food insecure are the small scale food producers in rural areas. After them, the rural working non-food producers. After them, the urban poor. But across that typology, um, women uh, are at a greater risk of food insecurity. In the States, women earn 70% still, something like that, of what men earn. It's, it's a condition that is, doesn't say all women and girls are, food, are more food insecure. It is a, it's a sort of a macro approach. And uh, part of what we're looking at is um, if, there's all this effort to say, well, let's address, you know, the gender question. Um, part of the issue is to is how do you draw women and girls into uh, the to participate more in work around food security, around the right to food. So why why isn't it working? So um, there. Uh, so I have three parts. I'm going to talk about two structural disconnects, five points to address those disconnects, and then next steps. Um, the first disconnect 
um, is this idea of a separation, is institutional separation of, of human rights, where the human right to adequate food and nutrition is separated institutionally and structurally from, for example, the Women's Rights Convention, um, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the Children's Rights Convention. Um, and there, there is not, so you have people working in silos and not necessarily building programs that really holistically work um, to address the legal obligations, institutional organization, programmatic delivery and research agendas associated with looking at gender and nutrition in the context of a right to adequate food. The second disconnect has to do with um, a separation instead of an integration of food and nutrition. Now I'm gonna talk so more on an international level now. We've been talking about it here, both at the national and international level, and the local level. Um, but the uh, right to food work is actually housed in the Food and Agriculture Organization. And it's very much production oriented. So um, it's the, the predominant uh, approach is uh, problem with food, you produce more food. The policy is you promote an agro-food commodity sector. Um, and the result is there is this bypassing of local cultural people and food sovereignty. And that bypassing at the local community level also ignores and patronizes women's participation, their autonomy. Um, and similarly, when you look at nutrition, um, nutrition is coming up as something that is based, and institutionally, the, the address of nutrition is based more in UNICEF and in the World Health Organization, not to mention different institutions in different cities. Um, and the answer there is to medicalize nutrition. Um, Raj had mentioned nutritionism. The idea is that you um, address malnutrition with fortification, vitamin supplementation, instead of thinking about building nutrition into more localized, more locally self-determined and controlled food systems. So you end up, the policy then ends up promoting a pharmaceutical sector. It ignores again local culture and sovereignty and again patronizes women's participation and autonomy in a structure that should be bringing them together. Another piece of this, though I won't go into it now, is that if you look at the way nutrition is um, talked about in uh, these international um, instruments, it is, it is based separate from the right to, f to food. It becomes something associated with children's right to nutrition, and nutrition being specifically associated with maternity and early childhood nutrition. Um, complicating factors in terms of thinking of a holistic approach. So now we're going to go to addressing these disconnects. And um, there are, uh, I have the five points. The first is to look at this structural separation and legal isolation of those human rights. And um, at a very practical, seems like a large step, but a, but a very necessary and practical step is to think about coordinating food and nutrition objectives inside these, um, the working groups, um, the committees on economic, social, cultural rights, children's rights, women's rights. Um, in the heart of that, it has to look at issues like not stereotyping uh, women as mothers and wives. Um, and it needs to address the inconsistent attention to nutrition. If you look at who, who's addressed in the context of nutrition, 
it eliminates all adult men and all adult women who are not pregnant or, or breastfeeding. Um, so, uh, and then there's this need to maintain a human rights framework um, an objective of holding governments accountable, something that is not, uh, hasn't, wasn't really, was definitely not part of um, the uh, MDGs. And it's a very big question about whether it'll be incorporated in the sustainable development goals post 215. Second point. So again, the question, why with all the attention on women, why is their condition not improving? So we as a group very strongly believe that there is, uh, that, that um, violence against women, thank you, is an underexamined barrier to women's right to adequate food and their participation as autonomous and participatory members of efforts to address hunger and nutrition. This is a very, very critical um, thing to address. It is connected to structural violence, um, and that is a condition of discrimination. The third point um, has to do with um, looking at how maternal child food, nutrition, and health has, um, has monopolized the discussion of nutrition, at the same time patronizing women's self-determination in the context of um, their, their delivery, their self-determination in, the, in bringing up their families and in their communities. It is absolutely critical to address uh, nutrition over taking a life cycle approach, an intergenerational approach to avoid and address issues like um, the cyclical um, reproduction of poverty through malnourished bodies that don't happen only during, uh, during pregnancy, but are a result of a lifetime of poverty that is recycled through discrimination against women and a, and a violation of women's rights, as well as the right to adequate food. Um, so the, it is critical to address um, local and sustainable interventions um, that look at, for example, breastfeeding as the very beginning of a food system and a food systems approach, um, and uh, starting with, uh, with building women's autonomy in a food system right from the beginning through their life cycle. Um, the fourth uh, area is food systems, gender, and participation. So um, this is looking at more localized, sustainable, smaller scale food nutrition systems, democratizing food governance, many things we've talked about already, supporting local knowledge, addressing men and masculinity in the food system, and mainstreaming women in all of the above, recognizing the challenges they face, particularly violence, structural violence. So the fifth point um, is associated with applying the human rights perspectives and tools um, when trying to work with uh, this phenomenon of um, women's uh, unequal access to uh, right to food nutrition. And the first and foremost point is to hold governments accountable to human rights. And we've talked about in that in various ways here. Um, and so I'm not going to concentrate here, I'm going to go to these last points, the next steps in human right to adequate food and nutrition from an institutional perspective 
It's critical to harmonize um, human right to adequate food and nutrition legal sources associated with nutrition and gender to de develop a more holistic approach. Um, coordinate uh, with the different UN human rights uh, bodies and develop a, an evolution of a systematic interpretation of sources. So one very practical example might be that and something that we've worked on together, the, the, the three of us or three groups working on this, is to um, work with the committee on um, the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. So the Women's Rights Committee to try to push forward a general recommendation on the right to food. Because right now, inside the Women's Rights Convention, they work, they address maternal nutrition and, uh, and rural women's access to the productive necessities of agriculture. They don't address women's right to adequate food and nutrition. So that would be a very practical step to take to harmonize. Um, the, the, inst the, the instruments. In terms of struggles, um, in the US we've been talking about a number of, of things. There's uh, the need um, to harmonize, to integrate the right to adequate food and nutrition uh, with other human rights efforts, especially, and, uh, ones that also grab the attention because they are they're they're so critical, um, and many of them um, address race and and the most marginalized in the context of voting rights, in the context of police aggression, um, in the context of housing, and I think there are many opportunities there to to build together on right to food, a national food plan um, ratification of some of these international conventions. I think we need to redefine the private sector. I think there's a real need to do that right now. If you look at the um, World, uh, the, the um, Committee on uh, World Food Security, we have this great civil society mechanism. All these different players get in there and have the opportunity. Private sector has their own sector. You know, it's all these huge, humongous corporate sectors that Bill Gates was organizing it. What happened to farmers being part of the private sector? They are entrepreneurs. I think, I think we need to think about um, what the private sector is and take it back in some respects, democratize it. Um, another thing is we need to work on recourse mechanisms. Um, a human rights violation of rights holders leaves them ready to hold their duty bearers accountable. They need recourse mechanisms and not just judicial ones to make that happen. We need to understand and think about what that could be. It could be, um, it could be parent-teacher councils. It could be um, social movements. It could, there are a lot of things in there. We just are beginning to think about what they could be. There is um, a really exciting treaty alliance that are on, um, on, the, on um, holding uh, transnational corporations accountable. I'm gonna give you a little more information on that. Um, I have to wrap it up, but I need to show hands. Who here knows about scaling up nutrition? Does anybody know about this? Yes, you've got to watch out for this. That's all I can say right now. It's a very dangerous, interesting, but dangerous group. We need to use extraterritorial obligations. Um, so the last thing I'm going to do is to leave this slide up. There is this global movement right now for a binding treaty um, on uh, holding the uh, transnational corporations accountable and um, it was the idea to work towards this binding treaty was um, reached last May or June. And in the next three weeks, there, the, the Intergovernmental Working Group is going to start to meet. I would urge you 
to um, look at this particular website where there is a description of what this work is about. There is a petition um, that uh, is trying to gain uh, interest um, in uh, support for a binding uh, treaty. And um, it's a great way to find out what some of, uh, more about some of the amazing work going on internationally. Thank you. All right, so our first question um, is for all the panelists. How do you hold countries accountable for human rights violations when our own government, I'm assuming that means the United States, when it's politically convenient, looks the other way? <laughs> well, of course, that's a very uh, good question. There, um, the U.S. doesn't always look the other way when it's politically uh, useful. It plays the human rights cards back and forth in terms of uh, using violations often of uh, political and civil rights in other countries. Um, it's been known to be very happy about drawing attention to the, those countries' limitations. There are mechanisms um, of, of review where um, every three years, I think, countries do reports on how they're progressively realizing the right to adequate food. And um, so this, this, is just, this is just one way, so we can answer it in others. Um, so countries need to report on how they're doing in realizing the right to food. Civil society organizations can write shadow reports saying, well, actually, you know, this, that, and the other wasn't done. Or this, these things weren't considered, or actually that's not true. And then the means, um, the means at the UN level it, it tend to be um, sort of shaming and, um, and, uh, and, and applauding. So the, the, the means are not very powerful, they're very diplomatic, but it's just one level. Other levels um, are more through direct public action. Um, and it's hard because there, there isn't much precedent. Um, I'm on the board, of, I'm incredibly proud to be on the, the board of FIAN International. And they do very uh, important work in helping civil society organizations, um, trying to hold governments accountable for violations of human rights, um, it, it, violations of the human right to adequate food. And I put a bunch of literature from the organization out on one of the tables. You can find out more um, at fian.org. So you need to have people documenting violations, organizing, um, and a lot has to do with uh, uh, Nadia's presentation because the national implementation has everything to do with it. But, uh, but this is where actually the, the work starts. With Marcelo's points. So my first reaction is that I have a problem with rights in general because it is so hard to um, get um, governments account of, um, to to um, how is it, accountable, right, uh, for their actions and for their lack of action to protect their, their population, and it goes back to you know organizing with empowering communities. Um, I was just telling Nadia that it's very encouraging to come to um, um, to come here because you learn about all these small efforts that are going on around the globe, and sometimes um, 
is just one step at a time. And you know, you can infiltrate a government or can you know, lobby in the way, you know, in whatever effort. We all have a place in this game and we all have to play it and we all have to go out and put our, you know, our heart out um, and, and do it one step at a time. It's a good and very hard question to answer. Um, I'm going to start with one answer that's not really a holistic approach at all, but I think it's a mechanism that's not well known about and not used very often. But each of the special rapporteurs to the Human Rights Council, of which I think there's over 30 now, have this ability to write to governments when they're informed about violations and lay out in a rights-based approach what they've heard has happened and how that violates specific obligations of the states. And these letters, they're called allegation letters, then are made public after a certain period of time whether or not the government's responded. And the government's response is also made public. And this is one mechanism. It's not that useful, but it's, it's one way to sort of publicly shame countries um, who don't follow through on their human rights obligations. And these get reported um, annually uh, at the Human Rights Council. But I think more broadly, the answer is sort of what everybody's been talking about over the past couple of days, which is collective action and demanding from not only our government, but um, other institutions to, to support and promote and protect human rights, both domestically and abroad. Um, Annie had this up on her presentation, and we haven't really talked about it that much, but this idea of extraterritorial obligations that the US government has obligations to protect and promote and fulfill the right to food um, of citizens abroad where American actors are, are going abroad and engaging in activities in other countries like mining industry or even in American trade policies that they need to be considering how um, their actions affect people abroad. So I don't, I don't know if that answers the question, but it's another mechanism and means out there. I have a quick follow-up to that question, actually. I don't know if that's allowed from the moderator, but <laughs> um, Nadia, is the U.S. actually fulfilling those extraterritorial obligations that you just mentioned? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, the sort of elaboration of ETOs, as they're called, is a relatively new phenomenon and idea. If you're interested in learning more about that, there's something called the Maastricht Principles, which are, were elaborated by a number of human rights experts, I don't know, maybe five years ago, that, that really detail um, states' extraterritorial economic, social, cultural rights, if you're interested in more information. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Marcella, but I think this also builds on Ani's talk a bit. Um, so thinking about the Malawi example that Raj shared in his presentation, how involved are men in your work in Nicaragua and what percentage of women are co-op members? And I guess to follow up and sort of tie in some of what Ani talked about, if the percentage is low, what, what sort of mechanisms that Ani talked about um, have you considered in those communities or um, are you considering in those communities? So specific to Nicaragua is, um, you know, it's a very special place in a way because there was a socialist revolution that um, has worked on women's rights. Um, so more than other countries, I wouldn't say that is, you know, that. But so, you know, we actually have projects in um, Guatemala and Mexico and we started in Colombia. And I have to say that women in Nicaragua are much more empowered than those countries. Um, yet, when Rush was presenting that case, I was thinking, no way, <laughs> that would never happen. Um, but of course it happens because there was a, a great a network, a community network, there was a, a leader. Leadership is the key, I have to say. Um, and so there was a leader that it was very effective, uh, very compassionate, that has the uh, trust of the, of the community, 
and, and there was follow-up. You know, there is, we have all these programs that come with great solutions and, um, you know, great ideas, but there is no follow-up. There is no transfer of knowledge to the community. So, um, you know, education, we are working on education. The percentage in this co-op of women is low. It's not that low in comparison with other coffee cooperatives, but it's still, I think it's under 30%. Um, and, and there is a lot of machismo, uh, of course. But um, there is the, the general manager of this co-op is a woman and she has been working very hard on, on this issue. So I think that I have seen a change in the last 10 years because I actually I've been working with this community for the last 10 years, not exactly on food security. And I have seen a change in uh, women's empowerment but I am eager to keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nadia, this is a, a practical question. So can you give an example of a recent case or enforcement action that highlights how communities have enforced their rights to food in ways that involve the law specifically? Sure. Um, so I spoke about the India case. I'll speak about a case uh, in Uganda that actually Fian um, has worked on for many years. There was a community of subsistence farmers in Uganda who uh, were evicted when a coffee, quite brutally, when a coffee company called Quere Coffee, which is a subsidiary of Nestle, came into the community um, and really brutally evicted them from the farms that they used for subsistence agriculture and the government turned a blind eye to this. And one of the many ways in which they fought back against this was to bring a court case uh, in Uganda um, to, to challenge that the government had violated its obligation to respect and protect their right to food uh, by failing to stop this eviction. And the case spent a very long time uh, running through the Ugandan courts and Uganda doesn't have a right to food in its constitution, but it does have um, the right to food as sort of an objective principle to work towards. And they were successful in this challenge um, and received compensation from the state by way of this court case. Great, thank you. Um, this question's for Ani. Ani, you raised the concept of not compartmentalizing the right to food from other basic human rights. Is there leadership or a movement internationally to accomplish this? Well, I would say, I would say that there are a um, number of, of movements. I'll, I want to mention one. It's called the Global Network on the Right to Adequate Food and Nutrition, the Global Network on the Right to Adequate Food and Nutrition. And um, it is a network of uh, very diverse groups. Nadia quoted um, Lalji, who is uh, with the pastoralists, so it has tried to include you know, it's not just small-scale farmers, it's pastoralists, it's food providers, it's, um, it's people who um, live from uh, forest uh, resources. Um, it is, they have been uh, working to try to develop a network to spread information about and about new developments at the international level and organize responses to them, which is, and they are connected in turn um, with the civil society mechanism, the CSM. Uh, there is this thing called the Reformed Committee on World Food Security. It reformed, I think, in 2010 or 2009. And it was this lackadaisical group, intergovernmental um, sort of uh, group of UN 
entities that were supposedly working on food security from the early 70s and were known for not doing very much. And uh, they reformed after the food crisis of 2008. And, um, and they have a place for civil society, for international research groups, funders, foundations, uh, the World Bank, um, and the private sector, as I'd mentioned. And the civil society mechanism is this really cool entity. You can read about it. It's the, the way it's set up is available online to try to have a space, uh, an open space that is a, a, a sort of a negotiated space for all these diverse groups to take turns on a geographically representative, sort of a, a focus representative, a gender representative um, basis to participate um, in these global discussions. So there are, and, and actually it is a model at, at the international level for civil society participation in, in, um, in uh, the development of international policy. You might want to add to that. Great, thank you all. Um, Ani, I did want to ask you what scaling up nutrition was, because you sort of left everyone on the edge of their seats with that one, but unfortunately, we don't have enough time. Um, so thank you. You guys will still be on the edge of your seats. <laughs> um, so thank you to all the panelists so much. That was really informative, um, and your presentations were excellent.